Okay, let's get rolling. Uh, so welcome to all who are viewing this. And um, uh, I'm really excited to have a couple of very special guests on today. We've got two very, very strong and very prominent women in uh, Canadian uh, sports. We've got five, I think, Olympic um, births from, from the two of you. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on both uh, and to speak about your experiences and some of the things you're doing as an athlete, you know, when you were athletes and also now um, as, you, uh, as, you, as you've come out of your athletic careers. I know you haven't quite got there, Angela, yet, but... Um... <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Eventually, yeah, of course. Um, so Angela, you probably, you probably know Angela's name. She's a track and field athlete. She's been around for, I'm sorry to say this, but quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, three Olympic births, you almost made your fourth this year, and uh, three Commonwealth Games, I believe, Pan Am silver medalist, Commonwealth Games, silver medalist, gold medalist? Uh, silver and bronze. Silver and bronze at, uh, at Commonwealth Games. Um, in the uh, 100 hurdles, as well as a heptathlon, your, your two main events. Um, so really excited to hear um, some of your experiences and I guess your work as well outside uh, your, your sport. And also I've got uh, Dominique Bossart. So Dominique is a, a Taekwondo athlete uh, from Canada. And I only re recently found out that you're actually Swiss born. So we can talk about that if you like a little bit later, but um, uh, she's got an incredible history and background. She's the first Canadian to ever win a medal in Taekwondo. The first of only two ever, I believe, uh, in Taekwondo. And uh, this is also something recently that I found out was Taekwondo was only legalized seven years before you competed at the, uh, at the Olympics, which is an incredible story. So look forward to hearing you both speak. We'll, we'll start with you, Angela. Thanks so much for coming and joining us. Um, yeah, we, we'd love to hear more about your, your background, your history, some of your trials and tribulations and, and anything you want to tell us about your, your, you know, your journey as an athlete and uh, sort of edging towards beyond. Uh, sounds good. I'm going to start my watch as uh, all good track athletes do, just so I can get <laughs> time. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Brendan and Athletics Ontario, for inviting me uh, to be uh, with you and Dominique is, uh, you know, fantastic company. So I thank you so much for for having me on um, on this, uh, I guess, forum or or you know, just like a little chat. Um, so again, yeah, my name is Angela White, and I've been in track and field forever. Um, so I guess it's just a little bit of background, and I feel like my background is probably quite similar to most athletes. Um, I never actually, I didn't do track as a kid. I wouldn't say formally. Um, as a kid in elementary school, I honestly was just in the park. Um, and I grew up, um, I was raised by a single father and it was me and my older brother and he would just take us out to the park and whatever, it, if we're just like throwing baseballs around or, or playing basketball, he, he just, um, physical activity was, was important. I think he didn't really see it as anything other than just making sure that the kids get out and play probably more specifically for me. He wanted me to run some of the energy out because I was a nightmare at times, um, Sometimes to the point of like, this child is going to probably kill themselves, uh, climbing in trees, uh, just anything I could, I could do to, to like, I guess, express myself um, in physical activity, like I loved. Uh, all through elementary school, recess was a must. If I ever got in tr trouble in class and I wasn't allowed to go to recess, like that was, that, that uh, definitely taught me something. Um, so yeah, I was just an active kid, never really did any organized sports in elementary school. Um, it was just kind of, uh, just day to day messing around in the park, playing tag. I loved tag anything. Uh, and then it wasn't until junior high school when, um, I kind of caught wind of organized sports. So I remember, um, just seeing like or hearing announcements or posters for volleyball. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. It seems fun. So I tried out for volleyball and having never played before and made like, I think it was the junior team. Uh, then basketball came along and I did that. I vividly remember they were like, okay, now it's time to do layups. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. So, cause I remember I was that kid that was so excited to do things. I'd be in the front of the line. And then I remember just slowly moving my way back cause I didn't know what it was. Um, and then making junior, the junior team for basketball. Um, and then it wasn't until the summertime that I did track, uh, cause they had like a track day. And I remember doing like every event under the sun, 
uh, and quickly finding out that perhaps doing the distance events was not my forte. So, um, but I, yeah, I threw, I just kind of like what young kids usually do in track and field. You just try everything. And that's what is so beautiful about our sport is that there's usually a home for somebody somewhere, right? Whether it's in the throws, the jumps, the distance events, the sprints. Um, so I did that and I continued that routine year in, year out. So I would do volleyball in, in that first thing in the fall. It would transition into basketball. And then track was always just kind of a summer thing. Um, and quickly found that um, I started out as a long jumper, but I got junky knees. Like my knees are just kind of structured weird. And my dad was really worried about that. So he's like, you need to stop jumping. If you want to jump, why don't you do this thing called hurdles where you run and jump at the same time? And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know? So that's kind of where I got my start. I started off as like a long jumper, but then moved into the, to the sprint hurdles. And my dad was like, oh, you're actually all right at this. And he found me a club. Um, I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. So he found me the best club for the hurdlers. Uh, again, high school, same, same routine. Cause I just loved it. Volleyball, basketball, track, volleyball, basketball. So for my three years in Alberta, we do three years of high school. We go grade 10, 11, 12. That was my routine. Uh, once I started approaching my, um, my final year of high school, that's when I started catching wind of like, you could potentially go to the States for a scholarship. Like I've had heard uh, other people talk about it, other track athletes. Um, one of my really good friends, she was a year older than me, or she is a year older than me, and she went away to the States. And I was like, huh, like, I wonder how that happens. And in all honesty, I had no clue. It wasn't like I, I had one school maybe send a letter to my high school. Um, I had no clue about the recruiting process at all. And then it wasn't until my friend who went to the University of Arkansas she was like, yeah, you need to write letters. So this is back in the day where there was no real, like there was internet, but mm, it was probably, like, you're still writing letters. So I remember my dad went out and bought a video camera and he recorded some races. And um, again, we're so naive. All we know are, are the schools that we see on TV, usually during the weekends for football, right? So those are the big schools. So I'm sending tapes and videos and uh, letters to all these big name schools, having no clue that they've probably already recruited the, the kids that they want. And I was not one of them. And um, my brother actually did jump on the uh, internet and found the University of New Mexico. And he was like, he'd always look to see if they had some pretty good hurdlers. And he's like, maybe you should send a tape there. So we did. Time went by and it looked like nobody was really interested. And then all of a sudden New Mexico called. I was like, okay. Um, I went down for, I only had one visit. Uh, in the NCAA, you get five visits to, to five schools, uh, official visits. You can do unofficial visits as well. And I only got one. So I wasn't highly, let's just say I was not highly recruited. I was not a highly recruited athlete. And um, uh, it looked like I was going to stay in Canada and just go to the University of Alberta. But then uh, University of New Mexico called and said, would you like to come down? And I was like, well, yeah. So I remember I was like a week late to school um, because of visa things. And um, I got there and that was the first time where all I did was track and field. Um, it was a big transition. Uh, all of a sudden I'm thousands of miles away from home. I'm by myself. You know, it's kind of that transition for, for most kids who go like even if they stay home it's still a trans uh transition to move into university where it's supposed to be a little bit more responsible but um i found some success there but then eventually transferred to the university of idaho um it was closer to home and the coach there wayne phipps a great coach and that's when i started to really see success so my first year there is when i first made my um first ncaa outdoor indoor and outdoor championships um and then in all honesty, from there, just like every single year, just kept getting like building and getting better and better and better. So I usually tell people this, I'm, I'm an Olympian that didn't really think that they were gonna be an Olympian. So as, as a child, I knew of the Olympics. My dad obviously watching it. My dad's uh, Jamaican born um, and raised. So obviously he's always cheering for the Jamaicans and he would give me a little lessons here and there, history lessons. He's like, you see that athlete? That's Jackie Joyner Kersey. She does the heptathlon, she does all these events. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then just go run away. So I was never like highly, like from a young age, 
like, this is what I want to do. Cause I mean, I, my attention, like if I see a squirrel, that's it's, it's over. I'm kind of that kind of kid. Um, but I think what ended up, ended up happening was every year when I got better and better, it was like, well, maybe I can continue on until I reach the pinnacle of our sport, the Olympics. Um, and lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. So after my, I think my first year at Idaho, I ended up running sub 13 and that's, that's a benchmark, uh, Brendan, you know, in, in women's hurdles is like sub 13. Okay. You've arrived. Um, and that year also was the first, I guess my first major team for team Canada. And it was the world championships in 2001. Yes. 2001 in Edmonton, which is, um, it's, it's so like coincidental because that's also my hometown. So my very first championships, um, major, major, uh, championships was those, um, championships in Edmonton. And then from that point on, it was just like, you keep moving up the mountain. The next year was Commonwealth games. The year after that was another world championships. And then all of a sudden you arrive at the Olympics. So my first Olympics was 2004 in Athens, which I mean, the birthplace of the Olympic games, it, it doesn't get better than that. Um, and yeah, I just, again, it was, I think at that point, I just knew that this is where I want to be. This is where I belong. And, um, and just see how long I can continue to participate in the thing that I love. And fortunately, um, I've not dealt with too, too many injuries until later in my career, which, you know, this, this past year, yeah, I was, I was training to try to make this team for 2020 slash 2021. Um, but just came down with injuries, but I've been very lucky my entire career to just to not be too injury prone, taking care of myself, um, uh, and just able to, to constantly, I guess, take the lessons that I learned from the years past and be able to use them to catapult to, to greater things in the future uh, for myself in the sport. While I was all doing the athletic piece, I did also go to school, um, Obviously, I got my undergraduate in the States at University of Idaho, and then I continued on and did a master's there. While I was also doing that, I was I started out as a volunteer coach with the team because you're in the middle of Idaho, pretty much nowhere. So what else do you do with your time other than like hang around the track all day long, which is where I belong? So I was in school um, training and also coaching. And I continued that on, um, stayed in Idaho until after the 2016 games. And at that point I decided that it would be good to come back home. So I returned back to Edmonton. Um, I did earn, I earned my master's degree in, uh, it's called movement and exercise sciences. So essentially kinesiology, but my emphasis was um, in sports psychology. Cause I really do like that element of sport. obviously, the physiology side is really exciting. The bio, the bio uh, mechanics of it is really exciting, but there's something about use like the power of your mind. Um, but then also on top of it, it's also the spirit. Cause I think sometimes we miss out on, we become so scientific with everything. Everything needs to be measured, but a lot of the greatest performances that we have seen in sports and, and maybe we can all attest to this. It's really comes down to, to the spirit, right? Like, um, thing like overcoming barriers that nobody thought could ever happen. And so that always intrigued me too. So kind of like a little bit of the sociology of sports, um, spirituality of sports. So kind of moving into the philosophy of sports that is, has always been kind of like my academic focus, um, and really intrigues me. So when I came back, um, still training, uh, this was 2016, and then also kind of started consulting, doing mental training, consulting with with athletes and performers just in general, because dancers are athletes um, and athletes are performers. So it, they kind of, you know, the, the arrows go both ways. Um, and yeah, uh, that has been kind of my routine uh, because that's just where I see I fit in in this world, I suppose. Sport for me um, has been a home because I think sometimes 
I mean, this world can be confusing and, and we don't know where we belong or where we fit in. And I was lucky because I found where I belonged and fit in when I do sports, when I, and it's not just track and field, but it's just like other things melt away, whether it's like insecurities in some areas or um, worries in, in other areas. When I'm in the sports sporting environment, those th things seem to just not matter as much, especially while you're engaged in the sport. I know that like a lot of times there's politics that go along with it. Um, sports has become a big business and that can be problematic sometimes as well. Um, but while you're in it, and this is why I really love engaging with the idea and the, the, the notion of the spirituality of sport. So while you're in it, those things don't matter. Dollar signs don't matter. Um, like some of the politics, like those things don't matter while you're actually engaged in it. And it's more about the exchange of energies between people, um, between the event itself. Um, those things are just, um, they transcend a lot of the things that kind of handcuff sports, in my opinion. So um, that's probably why I, I just cannot stop being an athlete as much as maybe some people are like, it's time, <laughs> but um, there's just something about it that really does feed my spirit. So um, yeah, that's why I continue to do it. I'm starting to know I am officially a master's athlete and, and love getting to know the master's community. Um, our sport is, is amazing. Like I've been exposed to our para-athletes as well because we do participate with them in Commonwealth Games. That was my first exposure was in 2002 with para-athletes. And again, our sport is one of those in many sports where there's something for everyone. And that's why um, I, I just love being involved in it. Um, so that kind of just gives a, uh, maybe a elongated background of, of, of myself. Um, Brendan, you did mention that I've been through the trials and tribulations. I'd say there have been many. <laughs> so if you were to look at the graph of my success, like, you know, like you kind of trend up. And then at times there's like these deep valleys and maybe once you reach a certain level, it gets really difficult because those marks up aren't as great. So you might be trending up pretty steep and then it starts to plateau, maybe get a little bump, but then oftentimes you start to see these valleys and then maybe another little, you know, where you get back to a previous year, not your best year or whatever, and then back down. And those can be really, really tough. Um, for me, I don't know what, I think it's the challenge of maybe not even really, I, I guess I have a short-term memory of sorts where I'm not really so focused on where I was at my absolute best. And I always have to remind myself, like, this is where I am now. And how much further can I go from here now? And sometimes, you know, Angela of 2007, which is arguably one of my best years, uh, kind of creeps in. And, but then I always have to remember, like, this is where I am now. And it's still valuable to try to, to get a little bit better than where, where I am starting today. Um, so I think that's probably what's also helped me stay in the sport longer is that, I do have a little bit of a short-term memory and um, no matter kind of what the, the disappointments, they don't last as long, sometimes some a little bit longer than others, but um, I'm always looking forward to something new, to learning something new in the sport. Um, and I think from, if I'm looking at it from a sports psychological um, sense, I know like, <laughs> When I was doing sports, sports psychology was obviously was there, but it's not as popular as it is now. Like we never had a sports psychologist come and work with us. Um, we could barely get equipment to tell you the honest truth. So our sports come a long way from when I was, was in it as far as uh, at my school. Um, but when I look back, there were sports psychology elements in there that we were just naturally doing. Um, and I think for me, um, the biggest one that I can attribute to my success is goal setting. And uh, 
I never formally, when I look back, I never formally did goal setting. And I remember when I was in school, my professor constantly talked about goal setting, like ad nauseum. And I'm like, what is it with this guy in goal setting? I don't get it. Like there's all these other fancy, like, like imagery and like, what about those things? Um, and then as I got older, I'm like, oh, I get it. I get it because that I've never really jumped so deep into imagery. I've never really, you know, as far as like diaphragmatic breathing, that's kind of been a little bit newer of a, of a focus. Like, I think we did it, um, kind of not like a, like a, like a part of our regimen, it probably just happened naturally, but goal setting was the one where I would informally goal set day to day. When I show up to practice, what is it that I wanna get better at today? And for track and field, it's easy because we have a time, you know, like especially, or there's a mark that we can, you know, try to exceed in a practice. And that's, when I look back at it, moving up, that's all it was, was goal setting. And then when you reach it, you reset it a little bit higher. And that's all I did. And it was very, very informal. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get why my, my professor always said goal setting is one of, if you're going to master a skill, that's the one to master. It takes care of so many things, motivation, confidence, um, commitment, uh, focus, like goal setting to me is if you are going to explore mental training in sports psychology, that's going to be your hallmark. That's almost going to be bread and butter. The other stuff is good too, but I think goal setting just takes care of so many of those elements in, in all sports. And it's, it's tangible. Uh, it's relatable. Like you can, you can write it down or you can just do it on the fly. Um, but I think that's what took me from being somebody that didn't think that they were going to be an Olympian to where I was able to, and, and very, proud to be able to be on three Canadian Olympic teams. And, and I really do attribute it to, to a lot of things like my goal setting for me personally, but then on top of that, my um, support group coaches, um, my teammates, my teammates were huge. Um, I think in track and field and, and even in probably Taekwondo, um, Dominique, you can test this. It's an individual sport, but I always did better when I knew I had a team, whether it was like, specific teammates like the vandals or if i had a group of people that i knew were cheering for me rooting for me um and not looking at it just from an individual i just for me that just never um helped me i always needed to have feel like i was doing something for a team so for me the biggest things that helped me with my success um goal setting and then just being part of a team and, and being able to share my experiences um, with, with other people, be it coaches, teammates, family, uh, therapists. Therapists have helped me so much along the way. So goal setting and sharing, sharing the experience have definitely been, um, I'd say pivotal for my success, but then also pivotal for my enjoyment and well-being in the sport, so. Um, and I don't know where we, I guess I should look at my time. Uh, but, uh, I guess, yeah, for, for me, that's, that's been me in a nutshell, like uh, pretty much what you see is what you get. I'm a track nerd. I love every, you'll, if, if you need to know where I'm going to be, go to your local track, you'll probably find me. So, um, or, I mean, you could probably even convince me to go to, uh, uh to Taekwondo. Like, again, I just love sport. Um, I don't know if it's called a dojo or, or what it is, but any, any place where it's physical activity, um, I'm just like thrilled to be able to express myself to this world in that way. Cause, um, it just, it's, it's amazing what it can do for not only our physical selves, but our, our mental, our mental health and, and just our overall well being. So yeah, that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I got, I got a few questions, Angela, but yeah. um, I'm, probably, I'm probably going to start with the most recent things you've been talking about and go back. First of all, can you show me your watch for a second? What's that? Can you show me your watch for a second? Mm -hmm. <laughs> show me your watch. I want to see it. It's a calculator watch, isn't it? Yes. It's a calculator watch. <laughs> can I just tell you, when I was a kid, I wanted one so bad. 
And I just never got one. Like for whatever reason, I never got one. And I remember seeing other people having, and then one day, and it, it just happens to be at Walmart. They just have them at Walmart. And I was like, the dream will come true. So I'm on you my second cal- one. <laughs> <laughs> you got your calculator, which I love that. Yeah. Um, so with regards to goal setting, and I know you, you do work with uh, a lot of athletes and I think for quite a, a large range of athletes, but with you know the athletes that are, that are hopefully listening to this and when watching this, what, what are kind of, I don't know, maybe two or three of, of and feel free to be quite diverse with, with your answer, two or three of the goals that you feel like, you know, a, a, a 19, 20 year old athlete who's just sort of finding their way in the sport of, of track and field or any sport really, but um, that you really feel are quite powerful goals that, that you learned through your process as well. Yeah, I think when I was starting out, so if I'm going to go back to 19, 20 year old Angela, again, I, I never just put the Olympics as, as the goal. Um, for me, I, I know other athletes who have, and that's been very pivotal for them to get there. But for me personally, and maybe some other athletes as well, I always kind of went in manageable parts, right? And um, I know like anybody that's kind of read about goal setting and, and things like that, we talk about the three different type of goals. So we're talking about outcome goals, performance goals, and process goals. And anybody that kind of instructs about goal setting will say process goals are the ones that you need to focus on because they're gonna be able to get you where you wanna go. Outcome goals are really good for motivation because they they keep you focused on on a bigger kind of long-term goal. I think the biggest thing is know where you are now. Where are you now? And then be able to set something that's just a little bit higher, challenging enough, but just a little bit higher than where you are. So whatever your sport, however you can measure your sport, I know some sports might be a little bit harder, but um, whether it be a process goal or performance goal, set it just a little bit higher. And I would do this on a daily in practice. So for instance, um, if we had a certain time to run, you know, the infamous three by 300, and we knew that, coming in, say if you had a time trial and you knew that you had a certain time, you're able to kind of calculate, you know, where you want to be next and you just make it, I'm not going to go like from, let's say 100 meter hurdle time. If I'm running 13.4, my next goal isn't going to be the world record, 12.20, right? Like, cause I know that that might be an aspiration later on down the road, but just set it a little bit higher. And then what ends up happening is once you chip away at that, the next thing you know, you understand what your standard is. What is the standard to get to a certain team, right? And maybe set your teams, if 19, 20 year old, junior teams, right? So understand what, if you're chipping away at it and next thing you know, you're right at that precipice of making that team, that's your new goal. Like whatever those standards tend to be um, and, and understand that, you might need to, you know, your time might place you in the top three. So that's how I kind of just pieced it together is like, it almost kind of, if you just keep chipping away and working up the staircase, a lot of times I give athletes a staircase to actually write these things in. And if you don't do it, it's fine. Either stay there or just make it a little bit lower. But if you achieve it, then set it just a little bit higher. Next thing you know, all of a sudden you find yourself And that's what happened to me was I found, it's like, I found myself at the Olympics because I just kept going step by step by step. And it wasn't like I was trying to catapult myself there. I just walked up the steps until I got there. And I think breaking it down like that makes it more manageable. And another thing too, celebrate those successes. Like once I made my first team, I was very, very happy and proud and I celebrated that. And then when we're done, you know, like, obviously be very proud and that gives confidence and then set it a little bit higher. But I think sometimes what we forget along the way is, is that we should be very proud of, of where we are able to get to. Um, and we don't celebrate it sometimes because it's not good enough. Cause I'm not there. I'm not the Olympics or I'm not a medalist. And it's like, you know, but you, you've, you've made it from here to here. Why can't we celebrate that? It might not be the world record or, or the gold medal, but it's not here. So whatever it is, make sure that you are celebrating those successes and then resetting the goal. Don't bypass and just say, oh, that was nothing. And 
I think that's probably sometimes I've done, I haven't been nice enough to myself sometimes. Uh, again, getting caught up in, in some of the elements of this sport that can kind of bring us down. Um, especially when you're working with, with certain groups and certain expectations and we forget that we still need to celebrate these really great things that are happening. Because if you do, then it just adds more to, to what you can do in the future. But then also it's gonna add to your history, right? Like when you go back and you look back on your career, if you celebrate that, that's it's gonna stay in your DNA, in your athletic DNA is what I call it, when you celebrate it. But if you bypass it, it doesn't get in there and, and everything's just like, it wasn't a big deal. Now it's a big deal. So make sure you set them so it's achievable and then celebrate them and, and be like kind to yourself. Because when you look back, you're gonna be like, yeah, actually that was pretty cool what I was able to do, whatever it is at whatever level. Speaking of DNA, you get some really interesting comments around, I guess, your relationship with, with track and field. And I love, I love that you, you, know, you, you used the word spiritual and you, your spirit was something you engaged in. And I guess not in a spiritual sense in terms of anything uh, dogmatic or religious, but I wonder, do you feel like athletes do engage with that these days or, or if, if they should engage with more of like what their spirit is and, and not necessarily getting too esoteric and, oh, you know, who I am, I, but who am I? But I, I, I really feel like the athletes, especially ones that have been in a sport for as long as you have, do engage with that spirit. Do you think that's missing? I, I don't know. I think, you know, when you watch, and this is probably where a little bit of it comes from, it comes from like when I watched my dad kind of engage with the Olympics and stuff, and you can see that it's not just sitting and watching and that's it. Like there's something that comes out of him watching and, and seeing other people achieve these great things, um, representing Jamaica or what, or even, I mean, he was cheering for both Jamaica and Canada um, once he moved here, but there was something in that that kind of sparked that interest in me. Like, what is it about the sporting experience, right? Like, what is it that can bring nations together? What is it that are the stories that last throughout the lifetime? Like, when you look, think of great athletes like Jesse Owens or, um, you know, Jim Thorpe, like the greats of our, our, of our time, like Wilma Rudolph, like, uh, and just even like the Olympics that just went by, Allison Felix, you know, and, and these stories that, yes, of course, medals, like medals are great, but there's these stories that go beyond, it transcends. And I think if you're only focusing on the material things, the, the things that are like tangible that we can touch, um, we are missing out. And I, I don't know if we talk about sport in that way anymore. I think it does become business. Like we talk about contracts and who got this and, you know, world records and like how much money does an Olympian make if they get a medal? And, you know, there's that whole comparison across the world. And yes, that that's great, you know, but when you're in the moment, if you're going to, and this goes into flow, if you want to get into flow state, we're not talking about those things. We're not talking about um, like degrees of where your foot was. We're not talking about um, necessarily split times. There's, there's like, there's something that there's a flip um, where you're no longer in like regular space and time. And so all the training that has gone in, it just, it reaches this other level. And it's almost like when you finish whatever you're doing, you almost come out of it and you're like, I don't even know what just happened. Like my best performances, I wasn't thinking about anything else other than being able to take all the skills that I have and just like absolutely letting it go, right? Letting everything go, being a part of it, being absolutely um, just like enveloped in it. And I'm thinking back into 2007, my, one of my best races ever was the semifinals of um, the world championships in, in Osaka. And I was so excited to be there. And that's another thing too. I think sometimes we forget that, yes, we can be excited to be there. You know, like we don't have to just be excited to be there, but it's a prerequisite, I think, to success is you should be very, and I'm not saying it's a mandate, but it's okay to be happy to be there. And I was standing next to Susanna Kalur, who at the time was probably arguably the best hurdler in the world. And I just remember 
like it's just the elements of the stadium right like you can hear just the people and and just but it's at the same time you can't and i just remember seeing her smile like i just remember like you're standing there you're waiting for introductions and i don't know what it was but i just like i'm next to one of the greatest hurdlers of all time um and i she's smirking and i'm like oh it's on i took her energy i didn't take it away from her but i i like i i took some of that into me to say yeah yeah this is this is happening right now and i all i said to myself was step for step whatever she does i'm doing and i don't know where that came from i don't know how that came whatever and as soon as we got into set i just knew exactly what i wanted to do and the feeling of just apps being able to be in control but to control that i'm going to be out of control if that makes sense gun went off step for step i stayed with her and it was just the most enthralling like i i i can remember it but at the same time i can't and then when i crossed the finish line it was like one of the best races that i ever had and the most i'd say one of the most enjoyable moments that i had because i remember it was this exchange of energy right like from the crowd from the environment and then also my competitor right um there's this concept of of true competition we're not like trying to go against we're we're trying to stride together you being your best is going to make me be my best if I allow it and if you allow it. It's like healthy competitiveness in practice, right? You're going to draw the best out of me. I'm going to draw the best out of you. And then when you cross the finish line, it's sometimes it's those moments that like are even better than just getting a medal. Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting hearing you talk about that very personal experience of you know the successes and, and, and non-successes. And I remember watching the games this year and I was watching the medal ceremony to these empty stadiums. And at first I was like, God, that must suck. Like, you know, like you're not getting, you're winning an Olympic medal in, and most of the time it's for the first time and you're not able to share it, right? But I really thought, wow, that must also be an incredibly personal experience where instead of having that externalized uh, cheering and everyone going crazy and that being where the energy is, that energy is so internalized and I, I'm, I'm yet to speak to in person to any medalists yet from the games, but I really would love to hear sort of some of those very unique experiences for these athletes that did so well and, and, and how they negotiated, how they felt when they didn't have that huge external stimulus. Yeah. And you know what, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to guess, I'm going to, I'm going to say that even though there wasn't a crowd and for some who thrive on it, maybe it was a detriment. But I think just the experience that we all went through for such a long period of time of lockdowns and things like that, once you have arrived there, it's almost like, again, it's this teamwork thing. And it's like, you're not here, but I feel you anyways. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to guess, I feel like obviously you're there to do a job, if you will, like some people see it that way. But I think it's like you get to be in this contained area and, and you do know that everybody's watching because it's the one thing that's almost like taking us out of the last two years of, of struggle, of loss. Like some people lost a lot, whether it's like family or businesses or whatever it is, uh, connection. And so in an odd way, without people being there, I still feel like um, there was connection. And then also on top of it, I mean, I can't speak because I wasn't there, but it just seemed like also like the organizing committee the volunteers did a great job of like still infusing that energy in there somehow like still making people feel special still making 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 them feel like like this is a once in a lifetime thing even though there aren't people there and to tell you the honest truth the, those games are probably going to be a once in a lifetime type of experience that we might not see like in our lifetimes again where you know the whole world is watching and and really experiencing it because we weren't able to experience these things for so long so i think it was probably still very special mm, if i'm great. guessing yeah <laughs> um i have one more question for you, angela um you mentioned before about your your injury history or kind of lack thereof and also your, your um which is just incredible to have a two decade you know the career that you did with with, with very few injuries um 
but also your background with, you know, how quickly you picked up your passion. You knew you wanted to be on a track and wanted to learn more about it. And you seem to have a very balanced life um, with, you know, your studies and your, you know, staying on a track to help out other athletes. Do you think that had anything to do? I mean, obviously your education as well fed well into you being an athlete, but do you feel like that probably had some impact on, on the longevity of your career and sticking around for so long? I think a few things have, have factored in. First and foremost, I, I got to give it up. To, like I've got great genetics. My grandma's 99 and she's still with us. So I do have to, you know, like obviously give, give some, some credit to that. Um, but I do think that being able to, to share and, and want to continue to build something to, to share with other people has, has definitely helped. I think there have been, and I will admit, there have been times when I haven't had the balance. And I think especially in the later part of my career, I've lost a little bit of the fun and the play. And I think sometimes when you are struggling and then you do get an injury, it's like, it's hard because you're, you know, kind of a broken toy, so you can't really play. Um, but I think the times when, yeah, I have had more balance. Um, those are the years where I seem to be the most successful um, for myself. And then I'm able to give more. But those years where I've just been a little bit to to myself. And again, this is just me. Some people do need to be to, to themselves. But for me, um, whenever I, I've just been trying to hyper focus on me and then like, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. Um, those have been really tough years for me and probably add to my susceptibility to injury, perhaps. Um, I, yeah, I, I do think when I am more balanced and I know Dom, Dominique can speak to this, you know, with game plan, they do a great job with trying to get athletes to remain balanced. That's when I've enjoyed it the most. And usually when I enjoy it the most, that's when also the success comes. I think sometimes we flip flop that we're successful. So we enjoy it. But I think for me, it's when I'm enjoying it, that's when I'm successful. So um, just the kind of a different way to, to, to look at it. So uh, balance has, I think that's been also the biggest thing, whether it's, it's goal setting, um, my, my support, and then balance. Balance everything. Like you don't have to be a robot. You know, you can do other things, make time for other things. Maybe don't be so worried about missing that one workout because you did this other thing. Because it's at the in the end, you become a whole person, and when you enjoy, you can succeed. A lovely closing statement. Thank you. <laughs> Oftentimes, I can't wrap it up. Sometimes. <laughs> and a great segue, Angela. Thank you so much for coming, and oh, thank uh, you. I'm I'm really happy that um, we brought you across to the dark side of Ontario, and hopefully oh, we. <laughs> Hopefully we get to keep you around and, uh, and we'll definitely see you around the track here a lot more often. And hopefully uh, everyone who's watching says hello and, and tells you their stories of, of trials oh, and tribulations as well. Yeah, I hope they do share. Sharing is, is the best part. So please share. And I'm still an Alberta girl at heart, but uh, yeah, I have enjoyed <laughs> being in Ontario for sure. Um, Ontario is a great, a great place for, our, for sports and our sport. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Angela. Thank you. Um, so Dominic, thank you for, for waiting patiently down there and a beautiful segue after uh, um, Angela's last comments and really excited to hear a bit more about your story. Um, quite unique in a very small sport of Taekwondo and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll let, he will hear more about um, the fact that it was a small sport when you became very, very good at it. And it was, I think, the first time at the Olympics in 2000 when you competed as well. Um, so looking forward to hearing more about your, um, your journey and, and what, what you sort of did as an athlete, but, and I, I think in the flyer, I did mess this up. I said that you, uh, led the game plan, um, uh, initiative that, that Canada has, has, has put forward, which I don't think is true. So you can tell us more about sort of your role with that and some of the things that game plan does do for athletes. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here and, uh, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me and, uh, Angela, what a great segue. Thank you for that. That was lovely. <laughs> um, so the way I sort of structured everything was I thought I'd talk a little bit about myself. I do have slides. Um, I did want to go into a little bit about game plan just to provide some structure in terms of or context in terms of what it focuses on generally. Um, and then really try to relate as much as possible um, to folks who maybe don't have 
access to game plan just yet in terms of their um you know stage of their sporting career but i think it just it's just such a great framework from which to kind of consider areas of um of interest and importance in particular when you talk about that balance as you just have um and so i'll go i'll go to the slides i don't know if you can see me and the slides at the same time we'll see as soon as i try to share my screen you but should then, be able to share Dominique. okay perfect but then afterwards we can just go like more to a conversation i love that kind of style as well and angela okay. if you have comments and questions happy to um entertain those too because i think we have a lot of similarities i'm also a prairie girl so um those 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 are uniting factors right there <laughs> so let me um First, I'll share my screen up here. And uh, let me just go to presentation mode here. Oh, starting off on the wrong slide, it's always great. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So I can, I'll start from here. So really it's gonna be a program description. And then I did include a lot of resources. So there's actually a lot of content as I get into it, but um, I won't go as deeply as I had originally planned. I'll just kind of go over the, the high level points and then we can talk a little bit more casually afterwards. And apparently I have the subtitle feature on too, so that, that's already done. So just a bit about me. Um, I am the game plan advisor here in Ontario. Um, game plan is a national program. So there's an advisor in every institute and uh, center across the country. Um, our real main purpose and function is to engage with athletes. I like to say we're kind of the boots on the ground to talk to athletes and talk to sports about game plan and about these principles in, embodied in the program. Um, so that that's sort of the education and um, knowledge sharing element of it. But it's really just to highlight these areas and, and make sure athletes understand um, to engage in these, these, these sort of pillar areas uh, early and often within the within their sporting career, and not just at the end when you're transitioning. I know originally the program was really pitched in that kind of way, but there's so much benefit when you uh, engage very early. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I I grew up in Manitoba. I grew up on a dairy farm. My family immigrated from Switzerland. You mentioned that I was born there uh, when I was three years old. So. So yeah, my, my entire childhood was a small town of, of Manitoba and uh, my brother started Taekwondo. He just wanted to do something different and then bugged me to join, join him. And so I did that and was really good at it, got really great feedback. I wasn't particularly good at school or I did play some other sports, baseball and basketball, but didn't really have any um, sort of particular encouragement from coaches or anything like that but in taekwondo I really got that one-to-one -one feedback and at one point my my taekwondo instructor said to me well maybe one day you can go to the, go to nationals literally that one line and I was hooked so that was it for me from there I was about 13 years old when I started I went to my first nationals happened to be in Winnipeg uh, so home city um, and so I went and I won my first nationals so to everybody's surprise and my own. So from there, I went to my first ever world championships uh, in New York City at Madison Square Garden, had no idea what Madison Square Garden was. Um, and then, you know, won a couple fat fights. So that was like a good turnout. Uh, and that was the beginning of a 15 year consecutive career on the national team. Um, and the highlights to that were really a, a silver medal at the 99 World Championships in Edmonton. And then, uh, of course, bronze, uh, bronze medal in, in 2000 in Sydney. And then I competed again in Athens, which was an amazing event, but no medal there for me. Um, so that was sort of the highlight to the career. I ended up retiring in 2008, not really based on my own, I mean, it was my decision, but <clears throat> I had an injury, I broke an arm, so I couldn't go to a karting event. And then that, of course, affected uh, funding and so that was gone and also the 2008 economic crisis um, took away uh, one of the programs that it was around at that time it was the Home Depot job opportunity program really great program at that time S kind of similar to RBC uh, Olympians but um, yeah so that that caused them to to eliminate that program understandably so but 
um, I made the decision to retire officially in 2008. So there was no program like game plan around at that time. There's a few services through the CSIO um, here in Ontario, but no, no formalized program. And so it was tough, but I was lucky that I was carded and was able to access Sport Canada, uh, Sport Canada AAP tuition um, and had benefits around that, of course. So I went back to university, uh, finished my degree, was sort of just trying to figure out what I could do um, without, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I, I just sort of took what was interesting to me. And so I did a, an undergrad in sociology and what was in, of particular interest was a program that was at the U of T called Buddhism, Psychology and Mental Health. So really, really loved that. Was uh, actually wished that I had taken that one before I was an athlete, when I was still an athlete. I found that it, so many of those principles could have helped me so much. But anyway, so really loved that aspect of, uh, you know, the mind and, and philosophy. Uh, to Angela, your point, it's, it's, it's such an interesting conversation in relation to sport in particular. Uh, but um, after I finished that, I was wondering, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And um, actually had started uh, doing some work for my sport, Taekwondo Canada, at, at, uh, as, a, as a committee member on the High Performance Committee. And that fortunately led to an actual role there. So that was sort of my first career type job um, in my sport which was a great opportunity. And I ended up progressing and taking on more responsibility. So for over about a three to four year period. Um, and then it was a, a sort of pivotal point was at the 2015 Pan Am Games uh, press release. So the kit launch and press release, there was a presentation by Deloitte and they, they announced their sponsorship of the Canadian, Canadian Olympic Committee up until the uh, year 2032, which was pretty, uh, profound and pretty unheard of as well. But what was even more interesting to me was this program called Game Plan that would support athletes transitioning from sport. I was so curious about that. I was so excited about that. And so started to do a bit of research about what is this company Deloitte and what are they, you know, what are they, a little naive, but um, what are they doing supporting sport in this way? And so became really, really curious about potentially maybe even working there, or just just curious about the company in general. And then literally very serendipitously, two weeks later, an invitation came from the Canadian Olympic Committee to past and retired athletes, um, inviting us to a workshop at the Deloitte offices to talk about our experience transitioning from sport. And I said, pick me, I wanna go because I was one, so curious about the company and two, so excited about this program that they were supporting. Um, uh, the development of and so went to those went to those uh that session and then was able to meet some really wonderful people um excited about sport excited about athletes and supporting athletes and so um just sort of kept in touch very like loosely but then about a year later um applied for a job there and let those folks know and i'm sure that helped me secure an interview uh but then it was able to actually get the, get a job at, at, at the Deloitte offices. So started off in audit. Uh, it was very administrative. I wasn't working on audits and doing that, but uh, was a great opportunity, great experience. And then I was able to transition over into sponsorship and marketing, which was really exciting and very interesting in particular because there would be work with the Canadian Olympic Committee and, some, and the, Par the Canadian Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee. And uh, of course, also some work with game plan. And so I was able to learn more about game plan and what, what it entails and from sort of a different perspective than the user side of it. Um, and then I realized, you know, at some point I realized I really just missed a little bit more of the hands-on nature of sport and the, in, the real direct impact that you can see as a result of your work. And so started looking for opportunities to move back into into sport and then again very serendipitously uh, a, a role arose uh, as as a game plan advisor so I applied for that and uh, and that brings me to where I am now so I started that in December um, and so that's sort of the history and I like to just tell that story uh, just because 
one, it highlights how valuable the program can be in a very tangible way. Even, even though I didn't access the program directly, just because of its existence, I benefited from it as having been an athlete and engaging in sort of that networking component. And, um, and so as it relates to other athletes who maybe don't have access to game plan, it's really important to take those kinds of opportunities. You know, if you have the opportunity to participate in, um, on committees or, um, you know, in your sport and various volunteer capacities and what have you, or other areas that you're interested in, you know, it's just so valuable to say yes to those things and engage because uh, it doesn't always pay dividends immediately, but it can very much so in the, you know, in a year, two years, sometimes even longer. So I uh, really encourage people to do that. I really love this slide from Tony Robbins. Uh, knowledge is potential, action is power. And I think that just in a nice way embodies um, what game plan's about. And, um, you know, we know so much, there's so much information in the world generally at our fingertips and um, that's all great and it's all there, but if you do nothing with it, it doesn't really support you. And, it, and when you take action, it really does, it can really change your life. So. Uh, I just wanted to share that as a sort of a starting point. Um, just to, again, go over game plan in, in sort of a high level. I won't go into too much detail, as I said, but it really focuses on these five pillars. So around career, community, education, health, and skill development. And if you're curious, you can look on the website. and There's like a lot in each of those sections really quickly in career. There's like career counseling, networking. Um, I can help with resume building and those types of things. Um, it, around community, there's usually networking and there's events that happen where we try to bring people together, like sport-minded people, athletes, business folks and athletes and all kinds of things like that. So a uh, really great element to the program. Education, of course, there's a partnership with uh, Queens and the Smith School of Business that is just unbelievable and, and provides so many opportunities for athletes who have been carded through the AAP carding system um, and health with a real focus on mental health. We can, it's quite obvious in particular after this last couple of years, how important mental health is. And I think um, sports and athletes are recognizing that more and more and how uh, we need to pay attention to this and provide supports in this area. So there's a lot available through there um, and skill development. So really looking at um, how to build skills in a way that, you know, sometimes athletes can't, can't go to school at the same time as a career, but there are things you can be doing throughout that don't deter from training or competition that I like to say this, your future self will thank you for. So, um, yeah, there's so much around that, around those five pillars um, to engage in. And as I said, I'm going to get into a little bit about the eligibility element but the real message I want to get across is that if you consider these five areas just as a, a point that you should provide some element of time and consideration toward can really help you maintain that balance in life. And we'll get to that a little bit more afterwards. But I want to spend a bit of time around why. Why is that important? And so pe many people before me did the hard work of uh, finding out why and why is something like this type of a program and, and why are these elements in particular important for athletes. So uh, through studies and testimonials, um, it, it, it became clear that 71% um, of athletes feel that non-sport pursuits have positive impact on their sport performance. So that's pretty impressive. 100% of multiple medalists would spend more time or equal time than they actually did on areas like education, family, friends, and other personal development. And 85% of athletes um, who have an understanding of game plan or these areas, these pillars, would recommend that to others. So it's similar to, I think, Angela, you kind of talked about it anecdotally, but um, you know some of the elements you focused on, I think, you would tell others to do that as well. And so, and I would do the same. So I think that's just a really interesting element in when they did some work with um, serving previous athletes and medalists um, about their experiences. 
as well. Um, this comes from the studies reviewed. So um, student athlete Olympians are more likely than their non-student counterparts to, to win medals. So that was pretty impactful, I thought. Um, and sport balance facilitates well-being and increases sport performance. Also, after I think even hearing from Angela and having discussions around this kind of thing, it's not really surprising. Um, and that academia and elite sport, they can support each other and enable um, student athletes to actually achieve better results, both in academics and sport and their sport career, um, particularly because skills you learn in one area of life can be transferred to another to benefit another. Uh, so I think that's just really kind of the science behind it all and, and kind of gives the proof points to why. Why is that important? I think everybody can appreciate that from the athlete themselves all the way to the coach and to the sports sector and sport leaders as well. Um, I said I'd mention about the eligibility criteria. So high level, it's for game plan specifically, you'd have to be national team or carded um, or have retired in the past two years. So that's sort of the hard and fast rule, but um, there is some flexibility within that. For example, for the Smith program, if you've ever been carded, you can apply. And then there's some um, other areas that are open to more folks and including even junior athletes um, and, and, and people in the system, uh, particularly registered with CSIO um, that can access um, some workshops and things like that. Usually when the emails go out, it would say if it's open to more people, um, but you can always ask me too, if that ever comes your way. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about what people can do, but high level on this slide, it's really about um, how you affect your environment. So, you know, you're a team member, you're, 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 you're with, a, with a club, and it's like, what can you do in terms of impacting the environment? Are you supportive of people who, of, of like, reaching out for mental health support if, that, if you feel like that's what you need, or if other people are expressing areas of concern in that area. And so I think that I always like to, when I was coaching Taekwondo for a short time, I was really always focused on that with my students, just to say, you know, every day you show up to practice, you affect the environment that you're in and you help create that environment. So what is it that you're bringing to the environment? That comes from the energy and the spirit you bring to a class or to the track or wherever you are. And also, you know, how you talk in the locker room, how you present, how you, you know, decide not to laugh at a joke or pick on somebody or those types of things. So, and those all really affect our mental health as, as individuals and as a group. So I think that's such an important piece to highlight. Um, again, this, this speaks to that a little bit more, you know, and even just being that, that one step more supportive if someone is expressing that they're struggling and that, you know, they might need some help or if it's even very subtle and you can just notice that folks are struggling, then what, what is it that you can do, um, you know, to be a positive impact on their lives? Um, and then there's some resources here, but I have, I have a couple other slides with more resources. And uh, Brendan, if you like, I can share the slide as well and you can share that with whoever is interested in it. Um, again, sorry, there's too many words on these slides, but I'll just speak to it. So you don't have to read it, but um, it's really, it, the, the sum of it all is really, it's a focus on planning. So having some considerations of those five pillar areas and then executing some planning around that. And you can ask yourself some questions that help you sort of guide where you wanna go in these areas. Um, and there's questions on each of these slides. So um, again, I'm not gonna dig into them in, in depth now, but. Um, this, this can be a resource as well to, to sort of take a person on a bit of a, a journey if they want to, they want to go down that path of, of creating some structure around, um, you know, um, developing a plan again in any one of those areas. And then I also have uh, some tools and resources on the side here for, um, just for some reference. A couple things is on the game plan website, um, anything that's publicly facing is available to anyone. So there's some really good stuff under resource, under the resource hub around mental health and uh, even a post games planning document, which I know it's focused on games, but I really look at the exercises and the, 
elements within it and there's just so many great pieces that can be attributed to any major event in life so you, even if you're transitioning you know from from one school to another if you are uh you know just having like a, a major competition like even a nationals or what have you can really apply in that case as well um, and then with OPSI athletes, there's some services specifically available to them through the CSIO. So if you're, if you are an OPSI athlete and listening to this, then you can reach out to athlete services uh, through that email there. So around health, um, really some main areas, the physical health, mental health, and as I mentioned, major event planning. Um, just generally speaking, there's, you know, you just want to be aware in, in terms of physical health, aware of bodily changes. You know, if you're, you know, focused toward the end of the career, maybe, or at a period of time where you're not uh, competing as much is when to focus on health and wellness and when to focus on high performance. Think that understanding is very important so that, you know, you don't not setting the same kind of expectations for yourself. When you're when you're training for competition and just training to stay healthy, those are very different things. And I think uh, sometimes it's difficult for athletes to sort of, I don't know the the right term is not coming to me, but to recalibrate. Um, I think that's a very important consideration. And then just focus uh, around detraining as well. Um, mental health, obviously, very important. Um, generally, just awareness is the first step. Um, having some preparations and planning in place for um, if you notice changes in it in your own mood and your own mental health knowing who to go to before anything even becomes an issue potentially uh, is important because I think if people get into this point where there's um, an element of crisis it's really hard to find the, the solutions and find where to go if you have that in place beforehand then you know, it's a lot more accessible to you and you're more likely to engage it. And I already talked about the major event planning. So again, uh, uh, Brandon, when we spoke, you asked for some resources. So I found some as well that are available uh, without um, needing to be a part of any program. Um, I came across this very cool um, set of courses um, by a woman named Dr. I think it's Lori Santos or Laura Santos. Anyway, she's a, a Harvard or Yale University instructor and uh, had one of the most popular courses in, in the university. I can't remember which one. Sorry about that. But uh, um, she put it online on Coursera. And it's also sort of as a, uh, a podcast on the Happiness Lab. And it's just really, really interesting sort of things that everybody can consider and can affect your perceptions and then affect generally your happiness really interesting stuff so i really recommend folks listen to that um and of course self-care self-care is extremely important and so there's some you know examples of positive and negative coping strategies and what what kind of things you can ask yourself and consider um to engage with so that you uh, do take care of yourself and, and hopefully avoid or not go down that um into the realm of, um, you know, mental, mental uh, unhealthiness. Oh. As I mentioned, network, community and networking is a really important part. So um, asking yourself these kinds of questions, you know, who are the people that are your champions that are, that are keeping you accountable, but support you too. You don't want to expose yourself to people who are always calling you down or not really uh, supporting you. So this is a, uh, these are some really great questions you can kind of ask yourself when you're considering who you have around you. I think we all know that it's, you know, you look at the five people you spend the most time with and uh, that should be an indicator of your, of your future. Um, I'm not going to go too much into education. Um, there's so much out there, um, but some really great planning questions. And for those who love to just learn on their own and kind of uh, do some, some study on the side there's a very cool thing through linkedin called linkedin learning and that's actually accessible to very many people through their libraries which i learned recently 
So you just go on your library, through your library card, you can access uh, LinkedIn Learning. So there is absolutely everything on that. And it's it's really great. I used to do it at my job at Deloitte as PD. So it's, it's pretty legit stuff. Um, and of course, Coursera, and there's so many others um, out there for, with, that have free learning. Career, um, again, some really good planning questions you can ask yourself. Um, again, and also the resources I wanted to just highlight, um, some career quizzes you can do, some personality tests to just tell you a little bit about yourself. I always say that these, you shouldn't hold that too tightly to them, but they're just sort of a guide to help you uh, understand some of the things that um, that uh, you know are the sort of strengths in your. Um, after you do the test, it sort of shows you what your strengths are and and um, and maybe some attributes that you might not have noticed. But um, I wouldn't obsess over that or be too focused on that. Um, it's just sort of a tool to help guide some direction. Um, and then some labor market information is always really important. And skill development. So again, to the point of, um, you know, taking the opportunity to build your skills in, in ways that athletes, uh, you know, kind of have a different path often, you can't take on as much, let's say, work, uh, part-time work if you're in school or doing those kinds of things. So what are things you can do to develop skills that um, future employers will will be uh, will consider as valuable? Um, it's such an important uh, element to engage in. I really, as I mentioned, I did as um, participating on a committee and doing like volunteer work and those kinds of things. I think are great opportunities. Uh, coaching part time if that's available to you. Doing those kinds of things really help you build skills that. You know your colleague, your peers are getting out there in the quote normal world, uh, but um, but you can also develop while you're competing, while you're you're engaging in high performance sport. So really, really important perspective on that, and um, you know just trying to take advantage of what your sport offers, uh, what your what the sports system in general offers. If you can get involved in those things, that's really really uh, beneficial. And then, of course, it's next steps to the earlier, uh, you know, slide about taking action. Um, that's that's what it's about. So just start. You pick some areas of interest and start to engage in that. You know, think about those five pillars and what you can do now that um, will help you develop in the specific area and then achieve some balance. Um, write down your goals. Write down the action items. And then you start to take those steps and that's how you really move the needle uh, forward for yourself. And there's no right and wrong. You know, it's really about um, take, you know, making goals, taking actions, assessing, reassessing and building and growing, learning about yourself and learning about, you know, the world out there. So, and we're all doing that all the time. It never really ends. So the better, the better you get at it, the, the more successful I think you'll be. Um, I love this quote by Winston Churchill. It's one really for myself because I'm a slightly a perfectionist at times. <laughs> Perfection is the enemy of progress. So really, um, you know, work hard, have a good plan in place. You start to take action and then you, you improve on the iterations afterwards. So um, I'll leave you with that. Or no, there's a couple more actually. So I love this picture because we talk about balance often and we think it has to be like the scales, you know, perfect balance. And that's just not realistic. We know, you know, there's different focuses at different times in life. And um, it's about, you know, maybe right now you're, you're trying to get into university or you are in university and you have to focus on exams. And so other areas take a back burner, like spending time with friends and those things. So it's really about, making those those focus areas clear and then shifting them but realizing that you have to later attend to that other area so that it, it is also uh, receiving the attention and the balance that it deserves as well and then I really just want to highlight like what others can do and so uh, people in the system if there's folks uh, 
you know, technical leads, sport leaders um, watching or listening to this as well is really looking at what you can do to help move the needle for athletes and, and help athletes also um, allow for time to attend to those five pillar areas in a way that's meaningful while also achieving the, the goals everybody has in sport. Um, so I just listed a few things here, but it's really, um, you know, about awareness. Coach awareness is key and coach engagement is key because, you know, the coaches and technical leads are really the, the leaders for athletes and athletes listen a lot to, to, those, to those folks. And so um, when coaches start to consider these areas for athletes as well and, and even maybe put them in their, in their training plans and, and um, athlete action plans, it, it really helps them to understand that it is in fact important and that there should be time allocated to that. Um, and I have just one example of a, of a one sport that it, that at least started to create a framework because I know resources obviously are often the challenge. So it's um, it's something that you can create a, some structure around, um, allow time for whenever it's uh, you know possible and appropriate. Uh, but just to sort of create that framework, um, even in the way of resources. Because there's just so much out there. It's it's not necessarily the case where you have to hire, you know, a mental health person or, um, or what have you, or another staff. Uh, but you can you can still in in very creative ways find the opportunity to provide that structure for for athletes. Um, so I just want to share that, and I think maybe that transitions, um, Brandon, over to you. I think that maybe you have plans to to start um, um, in this area a little bit within your sport. Um, but I'll leave that to you. And if you have any questions, happy to answer those. And of course, follow Game Plan and CSIO on <laughs> social media so that you don't miss anything. Thank you uh, so much. So great, Dominic. Th thank you so much. And I really feel like it's, uh, it's God's work you're doing because it's, it's a really... <laughs> important part of, of I think well, I mean, that those statistics that you put up before were so interesting um, in that the successful the more the, the more likely you you are to be successful does depend on how well your, your your life is balanced essentially and certainly in my experience I feel like Australia there's just a very different um, I guess culture in terms of sport and, and life and uh, working in the US for a few years, I was really surprised at all these athletes, professional athletes who just did nothing else. And they just didn't seem, especially if they were getting injured or if they weren't getting the performances they were getting, just, it was just all, all track and field, just all track. And, and I've really noticed how they just sort of on this tightrope <laughs> all the time. When things go well, it's awesome, but when they don't, and they're not even talking about the sort of the post career thing. So I, I I think it's just a wonderful thing that you're doing and an initiative obviously started by Deloitte, but I think that you, you know, you're a great person to be in this role and with your experience as well. And I love what you said before around uh, doing things that your future self will thank you for. Because <laughs> as, as track and field athletes and any athletes, um, you know, you get so caught up in, in what you're doing and as Angela was talking about before, like, you know, that what's my goal for today? And then what's my goal for this year? And then maybe you've got a four year goal, but most of the time you don't um further than the olympics and especially further than that and i just think it's wonderful that there are these conversations are happening um and i, I guess around those sort of questions and conversations I, do you have like maybe one or two like kind of hard questions that you would you know give to a ask a you know, maybe someone you had a relationship with but um a 20 year old athlete who was sort of not quite sure how they wanted to negotiate the the um, sport and, and, and student or outside sports sort of life and um, maybe some you know good pressing questions or things that they might not want to hear but are really sort of important to sort of think about yeah I think I don't know if I'd pose the like hard-hitting really really hard questions because the the reality is you know I think as humans we we we're kind of motivated by what's fun <laughs> you know we, we do things because we want to do them and so I think what I do is, uh, and what I would do, um, is just continue to try to encourage those athletes to consider what can they do 
you know, while they're enjoying their sport, while they're enjoying their time in that, um, at, that will also build skills in other areas. Because to your point of when an athlete is so 100% focused only on sport and then something happens that's beyond their control or they have an injury, um, then often I, it seems that the impact is so much more devastating. If they have other areas of interest in their life, it's not that it doesn't still create the setback and you have to work through that and everything, but if you have other supports in life, other interests, hobbies, school, something, you can at least um, move over to that. You just change your focus slightly. Um, you do the rehab and then you come back, ideally, like in an ideal world. Um, but when there isn't that, then you're not only dealing with the injury, but now you're dealing with major stress, potentially mental health issues. And then we know that the, that also then further impedes um, injury and recovery and those elements. So it's, it's actually an, really truly in everybody's interest, including coaches and sports in terms of administration to really start to consider how important all of those elements are because the way I'm seeing and learning uh, myself is uh, it's, it's those who engage in that that actually keep their athletes healthier and keep them healthier longer and keep them in the sport longer and have more success. So it's all the things you're after. It's just a very hard shift to make when it's like you're used to doing more is better kind of mentality and like, you know, that fear of, oh my God, if I miss a practice, it's going to have a negative impact on the end result. And let's just do one more, you know, even at the end of practice, one more drill, one more of this. But, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, the balance is better. The balance result, the balanced approach results in, 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 I think better, uh, performance results as well and better humans, better holistic athletes happier athletes i'm glad you said that because it's exactly what i was thinking just just better humans <laughs> mm -hmm. just become better humans um what are some of the things uh since i know it's only been i think since december you've been working um with game plan yeah um what, what are some of them and maybe it's a statistic or an experience you had with an athlete some more surprising things that you wouldn't uh, wouldn't have thought about before kind of coming into this role mm. I can't, nothing really pops into mind, to be honest. Um, just how much, I guess, actually, just how much I hear that, what I just shared about um, mm. the real impact and, and importance of, of having that balance. Like, I think I knew that sort of superficially, even as an athlete, that there was, you know, an importance to that. Uh, but yeah, just really seeing more and more understanding around that concept and um, around the need for it and the need for it to be to start to find its way into the planning and processes um, uh, that sports engage with which I understand is extremely difficult because everybody's you know sort of hamstrung by the international calendars and all of these other factors so how do you then allow for that for those athletes to to have time to go to school and, and, and those pieces. And, and you know what, for some sports, maybe it just isn't a reality, but what are things that you can do to, um, to mitigate against that, to still put yourself in a position where, you know, you're in a good spot so that when you do stop, you can go back to school um, and you can actually get into the programs you're interested in as an athlete and, and, and you know, sort of, thinking about things in, in different ways, uh, but considering the holistic athlete. And I think also, actually, maybe this is something that's not really surprising, but I think really important as well is um, it seems, and this is not based on survey or stats, but it just seems that um, many athletes sort of, if they don't make a team, if they don't make carding, um, they feel sort of left out of, out in the, out in the, you know, field they're sort of just almost dropped so it's a really uh i think it's just not purposeful by by any means is my opinion personal opinion 
but um, it's just a product of the system. You know, there's so many limited resources. What do administrators do with, you know, with those scenarios? But maybe there are things that can start to happen in a, in a more systemic way to support those athletes because, in fact, uh, maybe that's a future Olympic coach. And if you, if you have um, a more of a, a white glove approach slightly, you know, maybe that's extreme, but I don't know how another way to say it right at the moment, you know, a, a positive experience for an athlete leaving, they're more likely to come back into the system, you know, and, and provide, you know, support as a volunteer, as referee, as a committee member, as a future sport administrator, as a coach. So it's just such a, I just think sport has such an amazing impact, um, you know, on society in general, in Canada specifically. And um, it was my experience where I had a sport leader who saw value in that and helped me to reintegrate into sport. And so um, I've lived that experience and I see the value and just um, hope that more people try to do that wherever they have influence, you know, in whatever types of way they do. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, yeah, really, really insightful words. Um, gosh, I, I, I feel like we could have, I, I'll have to bring you both back on for a, a discussion on a spirituality in sport, because you both <laughs> touched on some really interesting points there. <laughs> Yeah. But I'm super conscious of time and I know it's, it's at the end oh, of the yeah, night. Oh yeah, it's so over time. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll let you go, you both go, but I just wanted to thank you so much for, for spending the time with us tonight. And um, I really hope that some of the athletes, you know, look through game plan. And even if they're not quite getting to that point just yet where they get full support, there's still so many resources available. And thank you again for putting together those slides and I'll, I'll pass them on to the athletes and coaches as well. Sure. Um, but uh, I'm sure we'll see you around the traps and I'm sure we'll see you at the track, Angela, but um, have an awesome rest of the evening. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again so very much. Thanks so thank much. You. I just, I just wanted to add one thing in terms of, mm. you know, wanting to make it very clear that for athletes who aren't quite there yet, it's also important that they know what is in the system for them. So just like, sure. you know, that eventually you can have access to carding and that support. Uh, this is a, another really strong element available to athletes in the system. And so uh, it's something to look forward to, something hopefully that motivates people as well. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to add that piece. And there's, I can share some other um, resources, PDFs, and you can just send them out as you feel is appropriate. That's that makes amazing. Sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And yeah, thank you for that, for that um, clarification. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, ladies, have a great evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank so, you. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see you both soon. Definitely. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye, bye for now. Ciao.